Okay. Um, so, how many of you treat dental phobias and medical phobias? Okay. All right. Mostly children or adult? Adult. Okay. All right. Uh, well, it usually starts during childhood. And what happens is during childhood, you know, you might have a parent who makes the child go um, and the child is refusing. However, by the time the person becomes an adult, um, it usually becomes worse and worse and worse because that person has spent years avoiding by this point. And because of that, that person has gotten comfortable to avoiding and feel that I don't need to go see my doctor or go see um, however, by the time this person gets to age 50 or 60 and 70, now it's become a problem. So we're going to talk about what dental medical phobias are, how panic attacks complicates the situation, um, the various subtypes of dental medical phobias, and then we're going to talk about specific avoidances that we have to target in treatment. And we'll talk about the strategies uh, that we need to integrate into a more um, uh, effective treatment plan for patients with dental medical phobias. Um, will someone close and shut that door back there? Because there's a lot of noise and sometimes I can't hear myself there. Can you uh, okay. Yes. Yes, I will address children. So, phobias are defined as irrational and excessive fear of an object. Okay? Usually developed in late childhood to early adulthood to res in response to frightening events or situations. So, for example, when a child observes someone else feeling pain, a parent, for example, with injections, that person, that child learns to fear injections. Um, so that's through vicarious learning of fears. If a child is in hospitals, for example, well, you know, when a young child is in the hospital, I would say that in today's world, it's a lot more humane. However, uh, you know, back in the 80s and 70s and 60s, it wasn't very humane. Children weren't um, given information about the condition that they were going to have or they have or in, in the procedures that they need. So it's quite frightening, right? And can you imagine being three years old and seeing this doctor in this surgeon suit? with this mask over his face. I mean, it would kind of look like a monster to me. I don't know about you. So it would be very, very uncomfortable. Um, anyone had an uncomfortable dental procedure? Many times, right? For some of us, if we have a lower tolerance for pain and a higher sensitivity to discomfort, we're going to experience any type of um, painful or even minimally painful procedures that much more. And therefore, all you need to do is experience it one time, and that may be enough to keep you from going back to the dentist ever again. So severe phobias affect about 8 to 18 of the uh, U.S. adolescent and adult population. That's a lot of people. Uh, female to male ratio is 1.3 to 1. And medical and dental phobias are amongst the most common phobias affecting 3.5 of the general uh, population with a median age onset of 5.5 years. So that gives you information that it usually occurs very early on in childhood rarely recognized until the person is in later age or needs some sort of um, treatment and uh, isn't going to get it. There was a case, a court case, and I believe it was London last year, where a woman um, was court sentenced to have, I guess, I guess, chemotherapy for her cancer because she was refusing to have 
treatment because of her medical phobias. And the court got involved and she was sentenced to have chemotherapy. So what are specific phobias? Well, they're marked and persistent fear that is excessive, cued by the presence or anticipation of a specific object. Exposure to the phobic stimulus provokes panic attacks. So this is where um, panic attacks may complicate the situation. The person recognizes that the fear is excessive and unreasonable. Um, however, isn't able to get over that fear. So some phobic situations that are avoided uh, include animal type of phobic fears, natural environments such as height, storms, water, blood ingestion, injury type, situational types such as airplanes, elevators, enclosed spaces, and other types such as contracting an illness, which then we get into more hypochondriacal type of uh, phobias, choking, vomiting, loud noises, and uh, even costumed characters. So who's ever been afraid of a clown? That would be the case there. So again, because panic attacks usually occur from uh, enduring a, a feared situation in medical identophobia, so we need to take panic attacks into consideration. So a panic attack is an intense period of fear, discomfort, and terror. Typical onset, of, of a typical onset with fear of impending doom usually lasts just a short while. Um, however, in that short period of time, people will say that they feel like they're dying, they're going crazy, they're losing touch with reality, losing control of their emotions or behaviors. That might have been someone having a panic attack. <laughs> okay, that might have been an exposure, right? Um, and the experience generally provokes a strong urge to escape. So, this is the fear avoidance reinforcement cycle. What does it mean? Fears generally have a vicious cycle. So if you take a look at this, you have your fear trigger. And the trigger can be being close to a dentist's office, knowing you have an appointment for a dental appointment, for a dental visit. Um, needing to be, uh, to get immunization shots or whatever. And just the thought of that trigger increases intense anxiety, okay? Now, what do we do when we feel anxious? We live in a world where we cannot tolerate discomfort, right? Which is why pharmaceutical companies are a multi-billion industry. Do you feel, do you feel hungry? You might need this drug. Um, so, we avoid discomforts. However, the problem with avoidance is that it gives you relief. Ah, oh, so you feel better. Relief is reinforcing. So therefore, because you got relief, the next time when you try to schedule another dental visit, the same thing will occur. You're going to feel uncomfortable, you're going to avoid it, cancel it, which is the number one complaint of many dentists. And guess what? You got the relief again because you escaped the trauma. You escaped the fear. Okay? Think of it this way. If you have a headache, what are you going to do? You're going to feel uncomfortable, right? What are you going to do? Are you going to go to the rock concert? Probably not, right? You want to avoid things that would increase that headache or prolong it. And when you avoid it, what happens? You might get some relief. The next time around, when that headache comes back, you've just learned to do the same thing. I need to go into a dark place where there isn't bright light, there isn't a lot of loud noise so that 
I can avoid any stimulus that will trigger more of a headache. Okay, this is, this is the same pattern that occurs and which guides us in learning avoidance. So some characteristics of panic attacks include your heart, feeling like your heart's gonna jump out of your body, uh, feeling chest pains, like your heart is tightening and you might be having a heart attack, feeling lightheadedness, dizziness, nausea, difficulty getting enough air into your lungs, so you feel like you're choking, your body becomes trembling and shaky, and of course, sweatiness, clammy hands. A lot of people also get a lot of GI disturbance. You feel like um, you know, you're, you're having diarrhea or you're feeling nausea, you want to vomit. Uh, feeling cold and, and heat in your body. And a dreamlike sensation that this isn't really happening, that it's happening out of your body and you have absolutely no control of it. So, and in other words, you feel like you're going to be dying if you can't get out of the situation. And the, the experience is so intense that you feel the need to escape, okay? And later on when we talk about the fight-flight response, I'm going to explain why all this happens. So let's talk about each of the different types of medical dental phobias. First we have the blood phobia. You know, it, we have a natural tendency to be squeamish about blood. Um, injury, deformity, it's an innate instinct of many species to want to avoid seeing their, um, their peers being injured. So it's almost like an innate response that we have and for some people if they learn to avoid it then that response becomes reinforced. It affects children uh, two to three percent um, as well as adults with typical childhood onset. And more than 50% of the cases run in families with blood phobia. With people with blood and uh, needle phobia, there's a genetically inherent, inherited vasovagal reflex, which is basically your heart rate drops after it's been tightened for a bit of time. And because it goes from high to low, your heart rate, you basically feel like you're going to lose consciousness and you sometimes do even lose consciousness and end up fainting. And this is the only response that occurs um, with blood and needle phobias. Okay, so when you have patients who uh, feel like they're weak in their knees and they can't walk and they're feeling limp, it's because of this response. So needle injection phobia, again, it's our natural inclination to fear being punctured. I mean, who in the world wants to be poked by a needle, right? It's a natural fear. So it's a protective mechanism to have our skin in one piece. Uh, so also, simple scratches can result in infections. Needle injection phobias affect five to nine percent of children and adults with typical childhood onset and tend to run some families as well. It can occur through direct observation or through uh, vicarious learning of negative consequences from needles. So for example, if you have the vasovagal reflex, you might faint, have nausea, um, feeling uh, the, the weakness in your limbs, and because you actually experience that, you might feel that the needle in itself is a threat to you. And therefore, you no longer want to be in that situation where you're about to faint. Um, also, again, if you have a very low tolerance for pain, well, being poked is going to hurt depending on what your threshold for pain is, that will determine how you experience the injection. Dental phobia. It's 
right fifth amongst the most common fears. And again, with many dentists, it's one of their uh, number one complaints that they can't, most of their patients can't keep the schedule. They would have a lot of cancellations, and that can and the cancellation costs a lot of money. So it affects about 5% of the population, again, with typical onset in childhood. <coughs> Particularly fears, injections, drills, con being confined. Um, I don't know about you, but some of those instruments that dentists have, it looks kind of scary. It looks like it belongs in a horror film, right? I mean, you have this thing that's spinning and it's making this a lot of noise that's, you know, being put into your mouth. It's pretty scary. If I was a three-year-old, I would be definitely afraid of that instrument. Um, again, if you have an, intent, an increased sensitivity to the gag reflex, which protects us from swallowing dangerous uh, substances, then you're not going to enjoy being at the dentist because, guess what? That response is going to occur more frequently when you're at the dentist than when you're not. Okay? People who also have this sensitivity to the gag reflex also may have difficulty. I mean, it could be so extreme that they can't even have their neck touched. Um, they may even refuse to brush their teeth, which can lead to a whole host of other problems. Next, we have hospital medical facility phobias. What can I say about hospitals? It's a symbol of illness, frailty, and death. Who really wants to be there, right? For some of us who actually work in hospitals, I mean, we might even learn or, or be traumatized by some of the things that we see. I remember being in a hospital as a five-year-old, and I saw a kid with half of his forehead gone, and it would seemed empty in there. And that kid looked like he belonged in the horror film, too. And I was completely freaked out with what they were doing with him. Um, so having to observe others getting a medical procedure can increase your, your anxiety through vicarious learning. F being separated from family and controlled by strangers, nobody would want to do that. Of course, again, today with kids, it's generally much more humane where parents do get a lot more uh, visitation time and some of them are even able to stay overnight with the child, whereas you know, back in the 70s, 80s, and I'm sure before then, that was not a possibility. Um, feeling trapped, that once you are in this hospital, there is no escape. Waiting groups, being around other patients who are ill. Um, so people with, with this fear may also have some hypochondriacal fears as well, being um, around other people ill, contracting germs and diseases, um, past experience of grief or traumatic memory. So if you've experienced someone who's uh, endured a lifelong disease and spent a lot of hospitals in there, that experience may be traumatic and if you haven't gone through your grieving process, it may trigger intense anxiety. However, that anxiety may be um, conditioned so that it's not just this hospital now, it's all hospitals. And then over time, it may not just be hospitals, it's any medical facilities. And then over time, it's not just medical facilities, it's even at your dentist. So it can be conditioned over time to generalize to other triggers as well. Um, People who are afraid of being in hospitals may not only be afraid of contracting diseases or illness from other people, however, also radiation. Um, um, there is actually a lot of um, healthcare technicians who have this fear of radiation, that they're around radiation all the time. Medical personnel. Again, if you were a three-year-old, you see this monster-looking person with this mask and just these two eyes looking out, um, you know, that may look pretty scary. 
um, people who work in the health industry, maybe a representation of illness. Um, for example, a person who hasn't gone to uh, the dentist for a long time may also be embarrassed by the condition of his mouth or her mouth. And therefore, because of that embarrassment, they fear the personnel more than the dental procedure by that point, because what is this person going to think of me? So the fears of being judged for one's health or lack of. Um, if you haven't gone to the doctors for the last 50 years of your life, well, you know, your health may not be at the best place. Um, also fears of physical exams, procedures. Okay, so when we are thinking about treatment, we're thinking about what? What are we thinking about when we need to consider treatment? You mean as a provider? Yes. Oh. Yeah. We're thinking about what the triggers are. Right? Because in the treatment, we're going to be exposing the patient to the triggers, whether they're internal triggers or external triggers. Right? So when you're thinking about treatment, you're always thinking about what the triggers are. Okay? So remember triggers patients want to avoid. Places, people, situations, such as hospitals, Dentists or doctor's offices, any medical facilities, those may be triggers. Uh, doctors, dentists, assistants, nurses, there are people that uh, a person with medical dental phobia may want to avoid. I mean, you can even meet them in a, at a gathering, at a Christmas party. And you can say, oh yes, I'm, I'm a nurse for doctor so-and-so and the person may run away from you, not because of you, but because you're associated with the health community. You had a question over there? Probably on the next slide. I was just saying, I always think of it as a person sexually avoiding the pain in the kit that I work with, rather than the situation. Well, you have to remember that pain is the result, right? So what we're exposing them to isn't just the pain, it's really we're exposing them to the trigger that they have overappraised, overvalued with pain, so that they can go through the exposure, they can go through the experience and correct their, um, their misconception that the pain is extreme. For a lot of people with medical and dental phobias, the anticipation of that injection is much more anxiety provoking, much more distressing than the injection itself. Because, again, it's the uncertainty that comes with the needle injection. Well, what kind of pain is it going to be? How intense will it be? How long will it last? What size is that needle? How long is that needle? How deep is it gonna puncture through my skin? All of those questions, the person will ruminate over and over and over again, which, you know, just spirals into a tornado of anxiety. And then when the person is actually there, because the person has um, spent so much time ruminating on this, <coughs> that the actual experience is not as bad. So this is the anticipatory anxiety of pain. Not argue. The kids that were actually do have to have extremely painful procedures, sure. but we can't give them anesthesia for it because mm -hmm. they have to be awake. Um, so it is managing the, the primary step of getting them there. That's huge to overcome that fear of the pain, but knowing that they're going to have it and then trying to kind of diminish it um, is a challenge. <laughs> well, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, again, um, we're talking about people with medical and dental phobias, meaning that they perceive something that is excessive, right? For a child who has to go through a procedure who has to experience excruciating pain, I wouldn't consider that a medical or dental phobia. I would consider that a 
like real fear. I mean, I would want to experience excruciating pain myself, and I would want to resist it. However, being a child with um, you know a lesser level of, of cognitive development, where they're not able to to understand the goal of this procedure, a child may experience it as a punishment. Why do I have to go through this procedure? I don't understand. Why am I being punished? I don't want to go. You get the procedure, right? So that may not necessarily be medical phobia. Okay. Is there another question? No, I was wondering because I, I have a dentist. I work with them for two minutes. Okay. Uh, I wonder, my patient, of course, had a lot of anticipation anxiety before visiting the first time, but still during the interview, I found out that um, they identified the CS, UCS relation. So, uh, what's the, the stillness that they are afraid of? Mm -hmm. For instance, the drill? Yes. And what is the, 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 the disaster that they yeah. expect? Is it painful or is it, uh, I don't know, the root, something like that? Right. And I think that's. Uh, very important because also uh, in research we found that uh, not the person of the dentist per se, as you said, is uh, anxiety provoking, but right. only the, the tools we have. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Yeah. So um, when we get to the questionnaires part, mm -hmm. you know, you'll hear some of the things that I will need to talk about um, in assessing. The triggers. Again, there are external triggers and then there are also internal mm -hmm. cues that we need to determine so that we know what to expose the patient to. Yes? I think it's just two totally different things of thought as far as when you have someone who grew up in the 60s and the 70s and they have that severe dental fear, because I'm a dental hygienist. Okay. <laughs> and here's a guess with my daughter. Okay. Um, but they have that severe dental fear. You know, you, you treat those people one way where if you have a three-year-old who you're first exposing to, to their fear, it's so different because you can you can really work with them or the adult that has right. that in-based fear. It's, it's just so different. That's right. It's that when, fear is so right, if you're working with an adult who's gone through years believing that this is going to be excruciating, um, it's about retraining them, re-educating them about this process, correcting right. their false assumptions. And then it's, I think, more about, you know, the pain, for, the pain, like she was saying, more about the this, this severe pain, or even a child who's been through something. But, with, you know, with the younger kids, it is, it's about, you know, I put my mask on, and it's like, what's that for? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's a scary mask. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, situations, any type of procedures, it could be the situation, whether it be giving blood or even having your vitals checked. I mean, for some kids, um, you know, having their vitals checked, putting that uh, on their arm, you know, this, the feeling like their circulation is being cut off can be very um, traumatizing for them. So, and you know, that tongue suppressant, I mean, you know, and then they experience the gag reflex, that can be uncomfortable. Um, physiological avoidances, so these are now internal cues that we need to assess. So, tactile cues. You have to keep in mind that internal cues will involve your five senses, okay? So any type of tactile cues, numbness, heart beating, injection, uh, pain, gag reflex, feeling confined. A lot of people say that when they, the one of the most uncomfortable things about being at the dentist is not being able to move. And not being able to move and also fearing that if you move, something will go wrong. You know, you can't breathe, you have to keep your mouth open. Um, and if you do move, I don't know, the dentist might slip or something and cut half your mouth off. Pretty scary thought. Um, visual cues, internal organs, blood, uh, even things like seeing a heart monitor that 
represent how well or not well your heart is working. Any type of medical dental equipment, like the drill that looks scary and belongs, that belongs in the horror film. Bright light is one very common fear, is that light that's just shining in your eyes. Um, auditory cues, I mean, come on, the drill. <laughs> that's a pretty scary sound. And then when you hear it um, going against your teeth, going against a, sh uh, a hard object, I mean, it makes a really high-pitched noise. Um, scraping, I mean, Sometimes the scraping sounds like claws on the chalkboard, and that's very, very uncomfortable. Um, you know, sounds could also be hearing your own heartbeat. You know, the, you know, the sound of your heartbeat can represent something else for you, depending on what meaning and what value you've appraised the trigger. So, taste and smells. Um, plastic, mint, blood, and generally when you go into a hospital, there is a hospital smell to it, and, I, and I'm not sure what to call it other than it's a hospital smell. Okay, so there are many consequences of dental phobia. Um, however, the most important or the most severe of all these consequences is basically increased health hazards. When you don't take care of your oral hygiene, not only are you um, causing deterioration in your gums and causing uh, periodontal diseases, however, what's happening is you have a buildup of bacteria in your mouth. So your mouth is this, um, it, it's like a sponge of, of uh, bacteria growing. And what happens is, guess what? When you're chewing food and when you're swallowing food, that food is going to absorb the bacteria and go down your intestines and cause a whole sort of other problems. A lot of people who have chronic infections, and, I, and it doesn't have to be uh, oral infections, it could be internal infections, have them because of their lack of oral hygiene. So other than the than the um, you know apparent obvious consequences such as having bad breath or having um, deformed teeth that could cause social embarrassment, the health hazard is definitely one of the most severe consequences. Um, increased pain and suffering, you know, uh, you can suffer for the short term and go to a dentist and get it done, or you can suffer for the long term. Oddly, people with medical and dental phobias would prefer to suffer the long run rather than just go and get it done. So. Consequences of medical phobia. You know, I've actually treated a couple of women who has avoided getting pregnant because of medical phobias. I have also treated one woman who's gone through two pregnancies and never got her vitals checked never got her blood taken during her pregnancy. I'm seeing some jaw drops out there. And what happened was that she was able to talk her uh, OBGYN into not giving her these procedures. Um, yes. Yes. Well, this, was, this occurred many, many years ago. So, um, so some of the consequences of medical phobias include your health deterioration that results in a lowered functioning. And because of your lowered functioning, it increases your vulnerability to depression because you're just not able to function as well. Um, increased chances of complications after surgery. If you had a procedure done and you left the hospital, um, if you have an infection or something happened, you don't get a check, well, that's only going to get worse. Refusal of getting your blood work, um, your vitals checked, limits the detection for uh, health risks. So you won't know if you have diabetes, you won't know if you have high cholesterol, you won't know if you have high
high blood pressure that can lead to heart disease. Okay. <coughs> um, a lot of people with medical phobias will also refuse to take medications. Um, so sometimes when you have chronic illnesses, you need to take medications to keep you alive, and some of these people would rather go through the consequences of not taking their medications and risking their livelihood. If you have a disease, well, it's going to just get worse over time, and it can result in injury, disability, um, and even dangerous situations to other people not just yourself. For example, if you have a disease where um, you're not getting checked and you're driving, I mean, what happens if you become unconscious or you experience pain while you're driving? This can be a potentially fatal situation, not just for yourself or other people who are on, on the road with you. Again, the case I was talking about in London where the women prefer to die from cancer than getting treatment for it. And there is a syndrome that's called the white coat hypertension, where uh, there's an elevation of blood pressure whenever you're in a clinical setting. And when that happens, it lowers your morbidity due to um, the increase in your vascular activity over time. So, these people, um, you know, they're constantly having elevated fight-flight triggers to any clinical setting at all. Psychosocial consequences. Well, if you refuse to get blood work done, it will limit your employment, your ability to go to school, uh, obtain health insurance, Sometimes even travel, some countries require that you're immunized before you enter into their country, and 